When the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart. Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the Chicago Dialogues, presented to you by the University of Chicago Center in Delhi, in collaboration with Prohor.in. I am Deepesh Chakrabarty. I'm a professor of history and South Asian studies at the University of Chicago. And I'm also currently the faculty director of the center in Delhi. Each episode in this program features a member of the university faculty, <coughs> in conversation with an eminent researcher or cultural personality from the subcontinent. Today's conversation is between Professor Lisa Boudin, my esteemed colleague from the Political Science Department, and Professor Prathama Banerjee, a noted historian based at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi. These conversations are curated by the best-selling author, Abhik Chanda, who will also formally introduce the speakers for this evening's program. Welcome to you all, and over to you, Abhik. Um, thanks so much, Dipeshta. And a big festive welcome to all our viewers across the world. Politics and passions, right? Now, as this title suggests, in this episode, what we'll aim to do is to explore what it really means to think about passions, effect, and atmospheric solidarities in politics. So, for instance, at what point does politics exceed the calculation of interests? How do revolutionary movements play out? How do authoritarian politics play out in today's time? Not just out in the streets, but increasingly in cyberspace. And how might a theory of democracy itself look once passions and polarization are adequately taken into account? These and other associated questions are what's going to occupy us over the next hour. And to help us navigate the various sort of pitfalls and trapdoors that inevitably accompany any serious discussion on politics. We have with us today, Lisa Wadin and Prasma Banerjee. Lisa Wadin is the Mary R. Morton Professor of Political Science and also the co-director of the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory at the University of Chicago. Her publications include three major books, which are Ambiguities of Domination, Politics, Rhetoric and Symbols in contemporary Syria, Peripheral Visions, Publics, Power, and Performance in Yemen, and her most recent award-winning book, which is called Authoritarian Apprehensions, Ideology, Judgment, and Mourning in Syria. She is currently beginning work on a volume on cosmopolitanism in collaboration with Dipeshda, Dipesh Chakraborty, Sanjay Set, and Prathama Banerjee. Now that brings me to, to Prathama. Prathama is a historian at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, Delhi. Her interests span political philosophy, the history of concepts, as well as literary and cultural studies. Her first book was called The Politics of Time, and her latest has just come out. It's been published by the Duke University Press. It's called Elementary Aspects of the Political Histories from the Global South. And it essentially studies how the modern political concepts of self, action, and ideology, and people came to be fashioned in the late 19th and the early 20th century India. Uh, she is obviously very passionate about politics, but equally passionate, as I've come to understand, about music and cooking. And as we know, all three of these are potent enough to take us by surprise. So Lisa and Prosoma, a very warm welcome to Chicago Dialogues. Thank you. 
Lisa, why don't we begin with you? We are about to complete <clears throat> two decades of the 21st century, right? And one would have hoped that the new age, this age of technology, would also be synonymous with the age of reason, the age of democracy. But unfortunately, worryingly, if you look at some of the major democracies in the world, we do see the resurface of authoritarianism. I mean, uh, a big case in point, I guess, is what we are continuing to see in the aftermath of the US presidential elections. You know, just take one example. Um, how do you view this overall phenomenon? Thank you, and thank you for having me on the program. Uh, as you were suggesting, we're witnessing the emergence and ongoing appeal of ultra-nationalist authoritarian movements in parts of Europe, Latin America, and the United States. This year, the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021 also marks the 10th anniversary of the Arab uprisings, whose exuberant calls for liberal democratic government in the Arab world gave way to bloody wars in the case of Yemen, Syria, and Libya, or to movements of authoritarian restoration as in Egypt. In the American Academy, grappling with the changing political situation meant a shift away from the 1990s triumphalist theories of democratic transition toward an early 2000s focus on authoritarian retrenchment. And in this context, liberal democracy's failures were framed in the rather narrow terms of electoral contestation and so-called backsliding. But the analysis of elite rivalries and undemocratic power sharing have also renewed attention to questions of variation in regional economic development and growth, as well as to salient problems of inequality, injustice, profound disappointments, rage, and fatigue. And these issues have gained significant ground. As scholars try to understand how democratic institutions, which seemed so robust, turned out to be so fragile, so vulnerable to craven corruption, and perhaps just as important, if not more so, populations supposedly committed to democracy turned out to demonstrate unmistakably authoritarian proclivities, often with avowedly racist and misogynist fantasies of repair that entail the return to a mythic past of greatness. Think, make America great again. So some of these moves towards authoritarianism and what were nominally democracies have also been identifiably populist, including the U.S. variant. And although there's been valuable debate about what populism means I'm using the term here to index the political appeal to ordinary citizens, which figures their desires and needs as historically disregarded by elite groups. So the Trump presidency, as scholars such as Sophia Rosenfeld point out, is a dramatization of longstanding historical tensions between democratic mm -hmm. ideals of popular sovereignty and the rule of expert knowledge. And it's worth noting, as Rosenfeld and many scholars of American political theory do, that the earliest modern efforts in instituting popular self-rule were constructed largely by Enlightenment thinkers in ways designed precisely to prevent ordinary people from having too much power. And there is, in other words, um, an 18th century logic that mm -hmm. produced a contradiction at the heart of liberal democracy, namely that the people were capable of self-government only insofar as governance was managed by a wise, learned political elite. And populism is a response to this logic. Interestingly, recent work in political science, my discipline, about democratic erosion and backsliding often sign up for a reinvigorated version of this elitist politics which to me seems like the wrong and decidedly unjust way to go. Mm -hmm. Instead, I think we need to take seriously the kinds of long-standing grievances and fantasy investments undergirding per current populist and perhaps more re relevantly in our present era authoritarian populist tendencies. And that means focusing on the affective dimensions, as you were suggesting, of populist appeals, including the ongoing impact of and reaction to elite-initiated neoliberal reforms, 
the pleasures of resentment associated with thug violence, the role of disciplinary knowledge in reproducing the conditions of possibility for authoritarian populism, and mobilizations and manipulation through social media and other new infrastructures for the stimulation and management of crowds. In other words, within general trends indicative of authoritarianism's traction, we need to identify and find ways of counteracting the structural problems, including what Raymond Williams called the structures of feeling that haunt specific democratic projects. Right. Um, and if we turn the lens, Pratama, to India, and we look at the entire sort of post-independence era, and we're coming on close to 75 years of that, would you say that here too, there's been a trend of personality-based politics? of people on edifice as compared to politics which is based on you know, specific social or, or economic programs, for instance? Well, it is true, Obik, uh, that in the immediate post-independence decades, ideals like freedom and equality, development, democracy, could elicit strong passions in ordinary people. Some would say that it was only in the 1970s that personality-based politics took off in India, with Indira Gandhi at the national level and cinematic personalities like NGR, NT Rama Rao, Raj Kumar, Jayalalitha at the regional level, becoming larger than life political figures with huge fan following, some of whom could even commit suicide on the death of their leader. But, you know, we cannot also forget that in the pre-1947 years, anti-colonial passions on the street would be unimaginable without the cult figure of Gandhi as Mahatma or martyrs like Bhagat Singh, whose images would adorn the walls of ordinary households as calendars and posters. But perhaps ideals are more easily grasped when they appear embodied in flesh and blood. I believe ideals almost always have material forms in exemplary figures, as it does in symbols like the nation's map, a country's flag, or even the raised fist of the revolutionary actor. So, Obik, the question to me is not whether politics today has become more or less personality based, but how is a particular persona constructed, produced, staged? Because at stake are not persons in the ordinary sense of the term, mm -hmm. as much as personages, persona, images. Different kinds of images elicit different kinds of passions. So Gandhi's whole endeavor involving disciplines of the body and mind, including fasting, silence, prayer, was meant to elicit non-violence. But non-violence was not passivity, a lack of passion, uh, as we might think. On the contrary, in the face of colonial military and police action, non-violence could only sustain if it was rendered into a kind of passion, commitment, impulse. In fact, Ambedkar's persona, the book of constitution in hand, similarly turned reasoned argument, rationality, otherwise imagined as a dispassionate orientation into a passion against the irrationality of caste prejudice. So the question to me is about how a persona or an image is constructed. Now, authoritarian leaders across the world, as we are seeing so clearly, display a particular kind of persona, an image, a language even, that incite hatred, hostility, and violence, not by being iconic persona as such, which is not unique to them, but by being one kind of persona as opposed to another. Right, exactly. And, and Lisa, I was wondering, just taking a cue from what Prasmacha said, if we talk about the 
the persona or the image that is projected, right? There, there is a lot to be said, not just for the cult of leadership, but for authoritarian resilience to, you know, in, in, in a broader context, right? So uh, you've, you've done very deep work in, in terms of both Syria and Yemen. And, and I guess you know, across that spectrum of work, one of the questions would be, what would compel the citizenry, right, to still stick with a regime that is so patently violent, that's so patently brutal? And what would make the populace just endure one atrocity after the other? And, and I guess, therefore, the broader question is, how does the cult of authoritarianism sustain itself over a period of time, over generations even? Well, there's no, there's no single seduction in authoritarian politics and no one size fits all authoritarian politics. So context context matters here, as Pratoma, I think, was bringing to our attention. Mm -hmm. the, the, the pleasures of surrender to a leader and the expressions of exterminatory rage in, say, Nazi Germany may have parallels with contemporary Trumpism, but the specifically narcissistic freedom that Trump, as toddler-in-chief, offers his ardent supporters is not only the product of economic policies that have disadvantaged working and middle-class families, but also the result of the so-called contemporary cultural wars in the United States, which is to say intensified conflicts over visions of the family, norms of gendered propriety, the aims of education, the role of religion in public life, and other such issues. Now in Syria, and Avik, you were, you were mentioning my work in the Middle East, the and Syria is the country in the Middle East, I, I, or one of the countries in the Middle East I study most specifically, mm -hmm. authoritarianism is long standing, beginning with the durable autocracy of President Hafez al-Assad who ruled from 1970 to 2000. And his regime relied on single party dominance, an omnipresent security apparatus, and a flagrantly fictitious cult of personality. No one believed he was the first pharmacist or that he would live forever or that he won elections by 99.2% of the vote. Nonetheless, the cult had the effect of enforcing obedience, inducing complicity, structuring the terms within which resistance would take place, atomizing people from one another, and taking uh, slogans and ideas that had been meaningful in the past and rendering them absurd. Additional modes of compliance inducement were introduced with the ascension of the son, Bashar al-Assad, in 2000, and his rule ushered in an avowedly upbeat, modern, internet-savvy authoritarianism. Institutions and rhetoric came to rely less on party mechanisms of social control and more on the ideological contribution of a newly emerging set of cultural producers, whose work reinforced the effect of regime organized market inflected civil society organizations or so called civil society organizations which tapped into a spirit of youthful voluntarism so quite different from the father or at least seemed different from the father the creation of a neoliberal autocracy in the Syria of the early 2000s in other words and two contradictory logics of rule. So the one cultivating desires for market freedom, upward mobility and consumer pleasure, and the other tethering advancement opportunities to citizen obedience and coercive regulation. This contradiction was mediated and managed in pre-uprising Syria before 2011, in part ideologically via a local image world, as Pratoma was talking about the importance of images here, that wedded private capital to regime control in a way officially epitomized by the seemingly glamorous, urbane and assertively modern first family. And you're seeing some of these images here, which exemplified cosmopolitan living and expertly packaged members of the regime as members of a moral neoliberal class. That image, in other words, of a kinder, gentler, urbane dictatorship crumbled in the second decade in 2010-11 as the regime resorted increasingly 
to brutal repression in its effort to crush the largely peaceful protests of 2011. What began with demands for reforms came ultimately in response to the violence, to calls for the toppling of the regime. So putting the matter crudely, to be observed at the beginning of the uprising were loyalists who supported the regime, opposition activists who organized protests and in a bid for solidarity produced a broad assortment of bitingly satirical assaults on the regime. And then there were a wide range of folks in an ambivalent middle who toggled between desires for reform and their attachment to order. The I am with the law billboard campaign speaks to the sensibilities of this ambivalent middle. So you can see in the picture using an open hand as the first letter in the pronoun I in Arabic, Anna, to assert the belonging of individuals to a diverse national we. In other words, it says young men and young women, big and small, rational and sentimental. The, the campaign was meant to embrace all who identify themselves as subscribers to the law. Now, this was devised by members of the professional managerial elite. And the campaign nevertheless registered anxieties about stability. And these anxieties ultimately proved efficacious for the regime. The campaign also demonstrated the potency of a politics of disavowal. So the characteristic location of a politics of disavowal following the theorist Octal Manoni is something like this. I know very well, yet nevertheless, je sais bien mais quand même. And in the case of the advertising campaign ran something like this. I know very well that the regime will not commit to the rule of law, yet nevertheless, let us act as though the problem lies with ordinary citizens. Disavow this logic, this mechanism of social control that is fundamentally ideological, unlike denial, recognizes the problem it then repudiates. Like wishful thinking, it reveals an underlying fantasy of repair within the existing system, giving authoritarian regimes on the brink a chance to recalibrate their relationship to rule. Now, this is arguably a different dynamic of the, getting back to your original question than one's motivating the growth of a disruptive, sick of the status quo populist authoritarianism, such as the ones we're seeing in place like the United States. Right, exactly. Um, one of the many phrases that that stuck out um, in in what you just articulated is that phrase we talked about coercive obedience right mm -hmm. and Pratuma, uh from an indian standpoint particularly when you're talking about the 19th century and and the the days of the raj and the, and the colonial very oppressive colonial regime you have the archetypes of the sahib right the lord and you have the subaltern right the the native effectively the, the serf the slave and i was wondering that you know almost 75 years post independence do some of those vestiges still exist and if they do do they still in some sort of subliminal way continue to exert influence and and make that you know coercive obedience still sort of present um, across the polity indeed indeed uh, in case of an ex-colonial society like ours I think impersonal and abstract structures of rule, uh, like the bureaucracy, the mm -hmm. judiciary, what we call the state per se, were imposed from outside rather than allowed to grow organically from within, which means that these institutions, structures, and indeed the very language of policy making still appear alien opaque, inaccessible, even incomprehensible to an ordinary person on the street. So in place of institutions, processes, structures, we often have personalities, big and small, who mediate between the common man, as it were, and the state, the common man and the policy ideal. Mm -hmm. But these mediating figures then become essential to the functioning of institutions. It's such that in popular perception, the institution or the process 
may very well become identified, reduced to the figure itself, to the person itself, be it the local legislator, the, the ward MLC, the collector, the police constable, or the prime minister, who then become objects of adoration as well as hate. Which is why I think, Obi, uh, and Lisa was gesturing towards this as well, it's far more difficult to imagine a politics based on systemic critique mm -hmm. rather than criticism of personalities. Right. But at the same time, however, I do believe that one should also look back into longer histories. Are there echoes in our contemporary of much older, some would say archaic values such as of loyalty, honor, devotion, and sacrifice that might have animated pre-colonial politics and secretly continues to inspire passions and attachments towards rulers in ways that are not reducible to the colonial moment. I think what we need today, and there is work beginning to happen, is a longer history of emotions and passions, mm -hmm. religiosities and devotions, mm -hmm. which has only very recently become the subject of scholarly attention. But I do think that passion per se may become the subject of history. And I think we'll be able to think better about our contemporary if we delve into that history. Indeed, that's, that's, that's fascinating. Um, Lisa, while I still recall um, what you said earlier, you talked about, you described how, you know, the initially very carefully constructed image uh, in Syria of, of the neoliberal, very benevolent first family starts to completely crumble away and implode, right, in, in the wake of the uprising in 2011. And taking that same, so state, taking Syria again as an example, uh, I was wondering how is it that the authoritarian leaders um, were able to exploit media, mass media, the digital medium itself to create, you know, political apas, create uncertainty, create fractures amongst the citizens. And in that kind of a context, right, what, uh, when, when you have pervasive misinformation across the board, what really happens to political judgment? How badly is it affected? Is it completely rendered sort of useless? Uh, that's a great question, Avik. Uh, so uh, now we're really talking about the second decade of Bashar al-Assad's rule in the war-torn dictatorship of Syria. We've seen the global media's demand for sensational content to drive regime supporters and well-meaning citizen journalists alike to massage, if not fabricate, evidence leading both Syrian citizens and global observers to doubt the validity of news reports and the claims of fact-finding missions. These conditions help the Syrian state maintain its counterinsurgency campaign, which works not so much by sustaining credibility or cultivating credibility in itself as by casting doubt on all alternatives alternative reporting. In an oversaturated, high-speed information environment, this gives it the advantage. They don't have to be morally have the high ground in the way that, say, the opposition needed to maintain that high ground. So the argument I make in, in my recent book about these phenomena is threefold. First, and, and this is a lesson that Syrian activists learned at tremendous cost. Too much information may actually generate the very uncertainty mm -hmm. that putting it into circulation was intended to allay. As the uprising devolved increasingly into violence, the Syrian state's ideological apparatus was no longer able to brand the regime as this kinder, gentler version of autocracy. So it learned how to exploit the conditions of fear and insecurity it was responsible for creating to counter human rights activists and citizen journalists' attempts to document 
the truth. So by disseminating its own claims and counterclaims and by taking advantage of an inexperienced, conflict-ridden opposition, the regime has not always been able to establish its own authority over the facts, but it has been successful in raising doubts about the nature of evidence and the credibility of oppositional narratives. Second, as scholars of American politics have pointed out, Information overload and the potential for uncertainty it generates may induce people to seek out opinions reaffirming their own. And this tendency towards balkanization can lead to polarization. So internet users, to take an oft-used example, tend to gravitate to sites that work for them like echo chambers where they're able to relish the sound of the stories they're telling themselves anyway and the stories they're telling themselves about the stories they're telling themselves. Mm -hmm. This tendency to stick to one's comfort zone in which believing is seeing, uh, to use Errol Morris's uh, phrase, may have little to do with actual facts, even on the assumption that the latter are ultimately knowable. The atmosphere of uncertainty cultivated by an excess of information can create what I refer to as siloed publics. That is where debate is restricted to narrow communities of argument, allowing interlocutors to take pleasure in encountering views that confirm their own. And third, I think this is the most interesting point. The very condition of uncertainty provides some with an alibi to avoid committing to judgment at all. So in situations where action might otherwise have seemed morally incumbent, perhaps especially in conditions of imminent danger, the uncertainty that results from information oversaturation can provide a potent seeming rationale for inaction. So in the context of massively intensified violence, reasons for hunkering down and staying safe do overwhelm. But in the first years of the uprising, this recourse to non-judgment was not so obvious, and it mattered. Nurtured by an atmospheric of doubt, Self-satisfied ambivalence justified political paralysis and withdrawal, particularly among the professional managerial elite, including cultural producers. Their silence helped the regime navigate the changing circumstances of its rule in ways that even when the authoritarian state wasn't directing the news, they were able to take advantages of the circumstances produced by this uh, level of uncertainty or atmospherics of doubt. All right. Um, Professor Mai, if we shift the perspective once again to, to India, now, and particularly to this year. I mean, 2020 has not just been the year of the pandemic, but it's also possibly from an Indian context been the year of media proxy wars, right? I mean, think of, think, go back to June and talk about uh, the death, the untimely death of Sushant Singh Rajput to the Indochina standoff, which in some shape or form continues to this day, to the, the, the agitation and protest by the farmers, you know, in, in around the capital and different parts of the country. And we could go on. There's, there's so many of these instances. And what we've seen as, is that there has been a solidification of positions across a divide, across a divide of, of political sort of nominations. And the media houses have actually fought the wars on behalf of the political overlords, right? So in that context, um, let's, let's make no bones about it. There's not just been a surfeit of information to go back to, uh, to Lisa's point, but there's also been active misinformation and disinformation. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question to you in that context, Pratuma, is why did we arrive at such a situation? How, how and why did things come to this? And also segueing from there, do you expect to see this trend continuing in the future? Well, yes, indeed I do. Um, it lies in the nature of what we may call the digital term. So without going into the specifics of all the events that you listed, and much can be said about those, though, let me just put it in a, in, in a kind of, in the form of an abstraction for, for the sake of a discussion. I believe, and I think all of us would agree here, and Lisa already 
said that in so many words. What we call the digital turn has qualitatively changed politics. So one, political profiling has become quite something else with big data accumulation and more complex forms of data analytics. So older statistical forms of demographic profiling has given way to the possibility of individual profiling based not just on social or demographic identity, but actually involving much more intimate aspects of the self, including what movies one watches on Netflix or how many times one visits a doctor in a year or one's sexual preferences or whatever. Which means that unlike before, what we call very private emotions can be tapped into as part of political campaigns. And two, as Lisa rightly said, information overkill can lead to uncertainty rather than decisiveness and conclusiveness, which may lead to political passivity, as Lisa's reading of Syria tells us, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a purely consumerist rather than an activist orientation in people, but it could also lead to a loss of meaning, a general alienation, and a consequent restlessness, volatility, even neurosis, who knows? Too quick a targeting of easy victims, easy enemies. Which is why trolling, abuse, hate speech, and mm -hmm. personal exposure to political blitzkrieg have assumed a different scale altogether in our times. And three, well, I think we must acknowledge, Obik, that the nature of political communities has also fundamentally changed with the near universalization of digital cultures via the mobile phone, which almost everybody carries. Mm -hmm. Constant connectivity, highly accelerated speed of communication, response, counter response, superabundance of not just information, but also sensation and stimulus, both acoustic and visual. The imagined anonymity of the internet, all of these things I think have come together to amplify, magnify passions and render feelings and affects more viral and infectious. In fact, media scholars today talk of affective communities in the digital age. Mm -hmm. And I believe, to answer your question directly, this is an irreversible process. Mm -hmm. In the way that the technology of print has come to say, uh, televisual broadcasting has come to say, mm -hmm. digital media has also come to stay. But I do not think we are as innocent about the cyberspace as we were actually five years ago. I think recent political events have exposed not just politicians and their malicious and malintended use of digital technology, but also educated the public relatively about the limits of the digital mode itself. So I think that's where I think a slow incremental changes of judgment may be expected in the next decade or so. Mm -hmm. Right. But, um, you know, that sort of still tells me that where you have a paradigm where there's this really this, this huge surfeit, this overload of information across channels, right? It, it can still lead to not just polarization of opinions, but at a, at a more endemic level. Um, he talked about innocence. Are we that innocent? Are we that gullible? I mean, think of, see what's happening in the US, right? And, and Lisa, we, we talked about this the other day. If we're talking about whatever we continue to see even today, right? Up until today, even post December 14th, where they had the Electoral College declare President elect Biden to be the the actual rightful, you know, president to be. Uh, you still have the current president, the outgoing president, 
claim that the election has been rigged, the election has been stolen. He's set out in the last two months to, well, six, six weeks or so, a slew of lawsuits across the country. And much of this is actually being fed by his own sort of news media. So there's that, that fake news, that misinformation continues uh, unabated, um, you know. And, and I guess what I'm wondering is where you have, uh, you have an economy, right? Where everybody go back to, go back to what, what um, Professor Ma was saying. Information is widely available. Information is ubiquitous. Everyone has access through their smartphones, through their laptops and other PDAs to information which is out there. They have access to different sources of information even, surely. Much of that information going around is free. But in spite of all of this, how has, in this particular case, right, um, Donald Trump and his faction of, of you know, diehard Republicans, how have they managed to use fake news, right, to, to really manipulate this mass scale disinformation and really still continue to galvanize the public opinion? And I guess the other question around that is, we still live in very, very uncertain, turbulent, extraordinary times. So given the, the pandemic sort of scenario that we are living in, does this exacerbate the problem? This has actually deepened the problem because we are living in a pandemic kind of world. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a great set of questions. And uh, I, I do think that the proliferation of websites disseminating fake news, the ease with which digital photos and videos can be doctored, the accelerated cycles in which such so-called news gets circulated, absorbed, and then superseded by the next catastrophe, the, the tensions among rival discourses registering moral outrage from different angles, all of these play a role in generating the contradictory conditions of generalized uncertainty and narrow expressions of a confirmation bias. The, the sheer velocity, it's not only just the amount, but the velocity with which information is produced and consumed, and the presence of, and Protomo was, was referring to this, the, the presence of algorithmically designed filter bubbles that keep communities of argument narrow. The kind of 24-hour news cycles that prompt professionals and amateurs alike to search for or create sensational stories. And the fact that the very democratization of sources, which seems like a good thing, also comes with new incentives for monetization. All help produce circumstances favorable to Trump's kind of epistemic insecurity. And these innovations have also enabled specifically the proliferation and circulation of conspiracy theories. And I do think that the pandemic outbreak, to get back to your question, Avik, has given traction to spurious claims. Citizens have found themselves trapped in unprecedented pressure cooker conditions where frustrations build in step with the need for coherence. People have a strong and understandable need to connect the dots and make sense of situations that seem so out of control. And conspiracy theories enact anxieties while also providing some relief from them. And of course, not all of them are false either. We can't assume that. So scholars of authoritarianism used to focus on censorship and the strategies pursued by dictatorships to withhold information. And now what I think we need to realize is that in dictatorships and democracies alike, we see excesses of information being exploited for political gain from what easily appears to be all possible angles. Granted, the intentional circulation of lies and falsehoods has long been a staple under authoritarian conditions, and granted, democracies are arguably driven by a different incentive structure with news agencies bound by their business model to construct and disseminate the news to maximize consumer clicks. But the fact is, social media like Facebook, Google, Twitter, Weibo, and a host of privately funded internet sites have proliferated all over the planet, making it difficult for communities to determine local standards or even establish what counts as a community, and enabling 
what is fast becoming a generalized global situation of epistemic murk. And the Trump administration has taken advantage of what is in fact a global situation. Conspiracy theorizing contributes to this murk, but also offers visions of certainty in conditions of non-sovereignty, to borrow Lauren Berlant's term, as if to say, I'm not in control, but I know who is. Indeed. Uh, Professor Mark, earlier you were saying that the very term digital has changed politics in India forever. And let's talk about the role of media, because just like in, in the US, this has not been the general elections this year, that was last year, but we have had a couple of very significant elections. So there's the election that has just been concluded last month in Bihar, and all eyes are on the election that's coming up next year in Bengal, right? Bengal, so yeah. how, how do you see the role of media playing out? in the future in India? Well, I mean, you know the answer already. <laughs> well, so in India, in the 20th century, the dominant image of the media, which at that time primarily meant the newspaper and the radio, mm -hmm. was that of the conscience of the nation. This was the legacy of the anti-colonial and nationalist media. Media is to do fact-finding, investigating journalism and reporting to the public at large. It was meant to be an autonomous institution, speaking back to power, as it were. That's how we still think of media. Mm -hmm. At the most, it could take the developmental messages of the state to the public, as became the role of all India radio after independence. And we know that. Now, with the coming of television, and the rise of TV channels owned by political parties, first in South and later all across India, we realized that media could also be partisan. What has changed in the last 10 years, I think, is not so much the transparent, transparent partisanship and prejudice of the media, which is there for all to see, and the fuzzy line, as it were, between news, paid news, and advertisement, mm -hmm. but the very definition of media as such. Media, I think, OPEC, and this is something that many of my colleagues at CSDS work on, uh, it, media is no longer identifiable as a self-contained institution, like the newspaper or the radio or the television. Media is actually everywhere in the form of the photos and the videos. We click on our phone and share the WhatsApp messages we forward, the opinions we express, the searches we do on the web. And indeed, the incessant backroom production of images videos, images, and jokes, mm -hmm. which are actually opaque to us, that, that production process is opaque to us as media consumers. In fact, media is now the ambience in which we reside. In some senses, therefore, I think we are all equally media producers and consumers big media houses notwithstanding. The result, and this is something that Lisa is also saying in different words, is that we can no longer know the source, the source, the technical reporting term. We can no longer know the source or even trace the path via which an information reaches us. As elections approach, and in India, there are elections on all the time, every year. So there is no non-election moment in India, actually. Yes. It's become like a continuum of elections. Yeah, some yeah. Or the other. yeah, absolutely. So we have continuous, frenzied media activity and greater intensification of passions. And But I think at some level, and... Uh, and this is only going ahead from what the discussion is, not disagreeing with what we have been saying, but mm 
it, in some ways, I think we should also realize that we too are participants in that media frenzy. We're not just victims of it. Right. In other words, when fake news reaches us, it's not just that the news is fake, but the fact that we want to believe it yes. is something that we should also be concerned about. Absolutely. I think we believe it, we consume it, and, you know, because it's on... Enjoy it. Phone, we enjoy yeah. it, and then we forward it. We forward it to dead people immediately. Absolutely. Don't, don't Absolutely. Even though we know that it's, well, it's a hoax. Even when we know that it's... Absolutely. Which is, yeah. Where we can believe it and not believe it at the same time. Mm-hmm. 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 Sure. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Um, Lisa, if you if you look at the sort of near misses or some of the failed movements or experiments around democracy, particularly in around the Middle East that you've studied, what are some of the lessons that we take from that and what prescriptions would they give for us? What possibilities do they open up for us in the future? Yes, uh, you know, part of it is that social and political transformations take time, but, but change does happen. And I don't think there's any going back exactly to the way in which it was before. I also wanted to just make sure that people understood that I don't mean to suggest that Syrians were simply consumer neophytes. On the contrary, the, the, the level of activism, the kinds of calls for fundamental change are, are, were admirable in the extreme. And, but I do think it's important to analyze the structural challenges to our human flourishing. And even in times of despair, to imagine possibilities for an emancipatory politics. So in spite of this globally calamitous period, there have been moments of light, expressions of a kind of luminous other wiseness, to borrow Theodore Adorno's term, that that counteract the dreariness of conventional politics. Whereas even a year ago, I would have said following Frederick Jameson that it was easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And, and maybe I would still say that. But the protest movement that have reemerged across the world are a source for hope. And in conversations about racism and misogyny, global authoritarianism and the perils of climate change, thinking is opening up people are talking about long-standing structural conditions of oppression and, and, and exploitation in ways that show at least that neoliberal capitalism is not exhaustive, that we can reimagine our multiple worlds and that there are leaders and social movements committed to fundamental transformations. Progressive agendas are coming to the fore in ways unimaginable a decade ago. And, and visions of radical redistribution in the form of reparations, defunding the police, and critiques of capitalism's, va uh, capitalism's vagaries are everywhere, including in the relatively conventional United States. So in this light, the defeat of Trump is very important. If only because despite his continuing popularity among some, a shocking number of people, if truth be told, it puts the brakes on authoritarian rule in this country and undermines his enablers. And it registers a desire among a strong majority for a world in which mutual respect and an acknowledgement of human plurality and some redress for the suffering of so many is needed. And the humor, the sense of irreverence towards venal leaders, the solidarity inducing aspects of laughter, the way in which comedy, which interests me a great deal, is an incubator for an oppositional consciousness and a mode for creatively engaging contradictions. We, we see this all over the world. I, I studied it in Syria and was profoundly affected by it. These are also heartening. They're invitations to political attunement. In which, as Alenka Zupancic puts it, it's only in the course of satisfying a demand that we recognize that we had it in the first place. And part of that demand is a reassurance that we're not alone in our worlds of critique. And because of my own interests in ideology, I would add in thinking about the possibilities for revolutionary change and the impediments to its realization, that we need to understand the complexities of ideological uptake. 
Ideology matters not only in generating belief or ardent loyalty, as we were talking about earlier, but also in creating fantasy investments that prove sticky, even when we self-consciously repudiate them. And ideology also generates ambivalence, and ambivalence, that toggle between attachment and desire, as Protomo was talking about so eloquently, can be crucial to the maintenance of status quo conventionality. So one of the lessons learned is we have to pay attention to the contradictions, not necessarily in order to resolve them, but to appreciate them and think about them when we're trying to imagine bypassing the impasses that keep us in, uh, in structures that are no longer doing the kind of affirmative work for us that they may have done previously. Absolutely. Um, by the way, love that Halloween cartoon we put up there. <laughs> yeah. a, a little bit of respite amid all the gloom. Uh, yeah. So I know we are, we are coming very close to our lot of time. And what we'll do, possibly, Prasuma, after this question, we would uh, sift from the, the large number of questions that have been posed by the live audience or the live viewers. And maybe we'll take up three or four that we can answer quite briefly, right? But before that, Prasuma, this is something that you have worked on and in, in politics of time, you've actually articulated this, right? That time itself, both as a concept as well as a lived in experience, right? Is itself deployed by history to produce you know, specific political possibilities in the future. But if you are looking at we we go to the future, but if we're looking at our current, at our present, which is characterized by this inordinate dependence on media, on social media, and, and also the, the constraints of things like social distancing and so forth, how is our current temporal experience of history being shaped as we speak? Well, I mean, as St. Augustine very famously said, I know what time is, but I can't say it. So I've written a book, but I, I still find it to be a very difficult question. Well, let me start like this. The least that I can say is that we live in post-utopian times. By this, I simply mean that no one is waiting anymore for the revolution to remember Tracy Chapman's beautiful song. No one is waiting anymore for the destinations promised by 19th and 20th century historical imagination, whether it be of universal socialism or global democracy or international revolution or perfect modernization. Mm -hmm. So in earlier times, I think, and I'm speaking quite tentatively here, our own futures seemed to overlap with and ride on the future of the nation in the achievement of freedom or equality or eradication of poverty or more recently the nation's pride of place under the sun. So with the loss of collective utopias, futures have perhaps become more individual, more uh, intimate, aspirational. But at the same time, Obik, I think there is a good side to the loss of utopias too, which is that we pay more attention to the here and now instead of simply waiting for the future to arrive. Mm -hmm. So the current investment of ordinary citizens in health or education or infrastructure actually indexes this deep interest in the present in current times. Now, do health, education, or infrastructure produce the kind of hope, passions, sacrifice that utopias of revolution and freedom inspired earlier? Do they produce great heroic collectivities? Perhaps not. But there is something to be said for slow, attentive, sustained, if dispersed commitments to the basics of well-being in the here and now, an aesthetic of the present, one may call it, an aesthetic of everyday life. But on the other hand, 
And there is another kind of futurelessness that stares us in the face. Global pandemics that we must face to face with mortality in a way that even wars have not, which make time stand still in a way. An afterlife difficult to imagine. And Lisa has been speaking beautifully on that. And not to speak of climate change and ecological destitution that inspires apocalyptic visions of the end of the world. The regimes of risk that we live in today has changed, I think, fundamentally, the texture of time for us. And the new sciences of prediction are not entirely able to assure us of foreknowledge or planning for the future. Mm -hmm. I really do not have, a, have an answer to this condition of being. But instinctively, I feel that we need to completely reinvent what we mean by history and reinvent our relationship to history if we have to invent a future for ourselves. And if this, but I don't mean to be pessimistic. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just mean to share the fact that just thinking of new histories per se might not take us somewhere where we want to be, really. Right, indeed. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, we have time for maybe a few quick questions. So Lisa, why don't we start with the one that Rochana has, has given us? And uh, I know you've read that. So we just come back to that visual. She wants I, you to elaborate on this. Yeah. I think she, I think she actually, if I'm reading the question correctly, she'd like me to elaborate on one of the ones beforehand, before the cluster that concluded with I am with the law, the image that referenced comedy. So can you go to, can you go back to the finger puppet one? So this is from the opposition-oriented comedy Top Goon, or at least that's the way it was translated in English. So this was a revelatory uh, comedy uh, basically produced by activists under uh, circumstances, certainly not of their own choosing. So remarkably courageous and brave. Um, in, in Arabic, it's masasat mati, which is uh, literally the straw used to, to drink um, a kind of tea that was often particularly used um, uh, by uh, folks, uh, as ordinary soldiers in the army. And the finger puppets, uh, there were wonderful satirical uh, comedies that provided a kind of solidarity inducing mechanism for people where that uh, folks uh, who were opposition identified could recognize others who were opposition identified and could uh, sort of um, undo some of the atomization and isolation that the politics of authoritarianism generated. What was remarkable about this comedy in particular was the actual representation of leaders themselves. There had been comedies in the past, some of them quite biting, at least in the context of stable authoritarianism, but they actually did not cross certain lines, one of those lines being that you don't represent actual persons. This comedy broke with that tradition. It transcended a certain threshold of fear and uh, rendered um, in a kind of collective disruption uh, uh, an irreverence for the leader that was uh, remarkable at the beginning of, of the uprising. So like many Comedies, it was solidarity inducing. It took what had been incubators for oppositional consciousness and it brought them to the fore. And it allowed us to recognize that we had a demand for parodying the leaders in ways that we didn't know until we saw it. And it made fun or amplified also aspects of his person, not only the banality, but also not dissimilar to Trump, come to think of it, but a certain kind of toddler in chief persona, um, uh, also making fun of his discernible lisp in ways that actually took away some of the potency of his rule and rendered him absurd instead of powerful. Right. Um, let's take Shomiran's question next. Let's put it up, please. 
right? So we're talking about regarding the environment, right, have become rightly a part of almost all major discourses in the world. And do you think that it's somewhat used as an eyewash by certain politicians to compensate for other shortcomings, essentially reducing it to a media stand? So effectively co-opting that itself to a particular partisan position. Um, I don't know, Professor Ma, would you want to take a... Sure, sure. Yeah. So Miran, thanks for the question. And uh, um, well, yes and no, in the sense that we do have, we do see politicians sometimes blaming uh, 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 ecological issues for what are essentially economic or social issues. And, and but I think the problem that we face, at least in India, is, is quite the opposite which is that despite the environmental and ecological issue staring us in our face, it somehow never ends up being a political cause at the heart of our democracy. Uh, and I think the question that we must ask is what is it in our political language, in our political frameworks that that, that fail, in a sense, to translate what appears as a very urgent issue of the future of a planetary scale to actually emerge as something around which people should mobilize and vote. Mm -hmm. um, my feeling, and this is, this is probably, uh, this is probably kind of taking the bull by its horn. My feeling is that the question of ecology and ecological disaster is not containable within the national and nationalist framing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has to be thought at a planetary scale, which is why our democratic politics, which is like in most parts of the world, democracy, the exhaustion of democracy that we see is precisely because it's training against that national framing. And so it becomes who emits more carbon dioxide? So the, the US has been emitting more carbon dioxide for last 200 years than we have in the last 50. So let's give us the right to emit some more. Now, well, I mean, there is a truth to that. Uh, there is a truth to the, to the industrial colonial past, mm -hmm. but that's not the way in which our ecological crisis will be resolved. We'll have to transform into it into an immediate political democratic issue. And both the media and our political forces either are reluctant or fail to do it. Yep, yeah, indeed. Um, let's, let's have the last question. Or was that the last question? Okay, this is the last question from Shubhajit. Um, and, and either of you or both of you can sort of chime in. So talking about, yes, authoritarianism causing social polarization and how can autocrats manage to unite disparate sections of people into a common narrative? I think, Lisa, you alluded to this. Uh, but yeah, let me just yeah. say that it's not always clear that they can, but in ways, some of, the, some of what they do is they try in part by arousing feelings of polarization and then smoothing them over or keeping them in check. And so there are often, you know, discourses about national unity, for example. There are ways in which um, class conflicts are displaced by ideas about, say, foreign uh, worries about foreign intervention. Uh, there are ways in which uh, people are encouraged to operate within what I've called a politics of disavowal. I know very well that this authoritarian regime is actually cultivating these socially polarized ideas, but I'll act as though the problem is really with citizens who by themselves are um, feeling polarized. So I think it's important to recognize the um, ideological, the, the importance of ideology in both cultivating social polarization, but also managing in many cases to keep it in enough check so that authoritarians can continue to rule. I'll just add that there sure. is also a, 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 another pretty simple and obvious answer. It's by inventing an enemy. Yeah, well, indeed. Yeah. 
So displacement, yeah, there's that enemy out there. I will not name the series of enemies we have faced, but there is Too always many. an enemy out there against which we unite, yes. despite our internal dissensions. And in the context of the United States, and when we see when Trump was running for re-election, the enemies were anarchists in Portland or, you know, the, the crime in, in the city of Chicago. And the enemy, funnily enough, or crazily enough, is not Russia, which is hacked into just about every system, starting from homeland security to education to health, public health to everything. And they're not the Absolutely. enemy because they're not allowed to be. Putin is not officially allowed to be the enemy up until, I think, Jan 20th, at least. Yes, yes. well, uh, I'm a little bit worried about what's going to happen and from that respect in um, January 20th when we have uh, a return to politics as normal and the <laughs> usual suspects uh, uh, returning to be politically demonized. Yes. Certainly, yes. Russia does deserve some sort of come up. I think, I think, I think one thing that definitely the, the, the pandemic has taught us the hard way is to be able to just celebrate boring normal things you know the routine the quotidian we will never ever complain i think for the rest of our lives um you know um I, and and we've, we've gone actually way over time but this has been such a pleasure lisa and and Professor Mar, talking to both of you and from a viewers I know, well, I know some of the themes or in fact most of the themes that we talked about today if not pessimistic but certainly quite worrisome and so as behalf of all of us here, you know, Lisa, Prasoma, myself, the backend team from Prohor, the, um, the center, the Chicago University Center in Delhi, the page that, and everyone, we definitely like to wish you in advance, Merry Christmas and a happy and prosperous and a very safe new year.